Okay, we are going to go on to chapter four and start talking about neuroplasticity. But first, I'm just going to talk about a little case study which reviews some of the concepts from chapter three. So in this case study, we have a 54-year-old year old woman who suffers from small cell cancer of the lungs and exhibits generalized progressive muscle weakness. Um, so the medical evaluation determined that the weakness is related to a neuromuscular junction disorder consistent with Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So in Lambert-Eaton syndrome, the voltage-gated calcium channels in the axon terminals at the synapse between the motor neuron and the muscle, also called the neuromuscular junction, is disrupted. So they treat it, it's an autoimmune disorder just like a lot of neurological disorders, and they treat it by using plasmapheresis where they remove the plasma, they f filter it, and they replace it with new plasma, somebody else's plasma, and um, it reduces the patient's weakness by removing the circulating antibodies to the calcium channels. Okay, So the question would be, why would the destruction of the calcium channels in the axon terminal disrupt the release of acetylcholine from the axon terminal? So we all know, having studied the events at the synapse, that the first thing that happens when an action potential um, reaches that axon terminal is calcium channels open. There's an influx of calcium which causes synaptic vesicl vesicles to migrate to the axon terminal, eventually merge with the cell membrane and dump their neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. So if the calcium channels were destroyed, you wouldn't get the influx of calcium, you wouldn't get the migration of synaptic vesicles, and you wouldn't get the release of neurotransmitter. So it pretty much taking out one step, one link in the chain, disrupts the whole process, and that affects muscle strength, because we're not getting a muscle contraction with decreased release of acetylcholine. So um, the big question in terms of physical therapy is would PT be beneficial for increasing the patient's strength if the antibodies to the calcium channel still continue to circulate. So um, one of the things that would make a PT session more beneficial is if we were to coordinate the timing, if we scheduled, coordinated with the patient and their schedule, and we scheduled PT sessions for immediately after their plasmapheresis session, they would have the least number of antibodies circulating, the most number of calcium channels, and we would have the best chance of increasing the, her strength. So a lot of times uh, coordinating with the patient's other treatments is really important for getting the maximum out of their PT sessions. Okay, so we are going to go on to talk about neuroplasticity. And basically, by definition, neuroplasticity is the ability of neurons to change their function their chemical profile or their structure. And by chemical profile, we mean the amounts and types of neurotransmitters that they produce. So um, the general term neuroplasticity is used to encompass habituation, experience dependent plasticity, which is learning and memory, and cellular recovery after injury. And we're going to talk about each one of those things separately. So habituation is a decrease in response to repeated benign stimulus. It's one of the simplest forms of neuroplasticity, and although it's not really understand, it's understood very well what the cellular mechanism is, um, it's thought to be associated with a decreased release of excitatory neurotransmitters. Um, it resolves in a very short time frame once the stimulus ceases, and prolonged repetition might cause a decrease in synaptic connections. So. Um, the example that I always give is um, you move into a new house, you're quite near the train tracks, every time the train goes by you hear the whistle blow and it drives you crazy. Um, after you've lived there for a while, it just becomes part of the background noise and you don't even hear the train anymore. Your friends from out of town come to visit and they say, wow, doesn't that train whistle bother you? And you're like, what train whistle? So you've become habituated to that repeated benign stimulus. Um, there is probably a decreased release of excitatory neurotransmitters in your auditory cortex, and you're just not even processing that sound. You realize that sound isn't it doesn't do you any good to respond to it, and 
your nervous system just doesn't even respond to that sound anymore. Um, if you lived there for the rest of your life, you'd probably never hear the train. So, the um, point being, it's a repeated benign stimulus. If you had a, um, it's in the same way that you get used to the feeling of a watch band or your clothes against your skin, um, if you had to every day think about um, how your clothes feel against your skin, um, it would be very irritating to walk around in clothes all day. But obviously we all do it, and so we've habituated ourselves to that. So um, a good example for PT, or two good examples really, are sensory desensitization, where we stimulate the skin gently and we gradually increase the level of stim to tolerance, and um, with vestibular disorders, we actually um, teach the patient to perform movements that reproduce their vestibular symptoms. Um, and you repeatedly perform that with the goal of making you less reactive to the movements that are producing your symptoms. And it can be very effective for treating vestibular disorders. Um, so basically, you, you do the thing that's causing your symptoms over and over again until you get used to it. And um, when in uh, 111, when Brenda was talking to you about electrical stim, remember the um, frequency and the amplitude modulation was to prevent accommodation. Accommodation is a form of habituation where you get used to the sensation of the electrical stim to the point where you don't feel it as much. So um, all of these are good examples of habituation that we use every day in therapy. So often right after surgery or right after an injury, someone is really super sensitive into that area where the incision is or where the injury is. And you might have to get them to take a washcloth or a cotton ball or something um, to stimulate that skin gently and gradually increase to where they can tolerate say the feel of their clothes against their skin. Um, sometimes after surgery it's so sensitive that it's difficult to even tolerate that. So that's a good example of how habituation is used in physical therapy. So um, we are going to... there are some videos on the Canvas classroom about neuroplasticity. It's sort of almost become a buzzword in um, even popular literature now. There are a lot of good books out there. Um, there's one that's uh, called by a an author named Norman Dodge, and it's D-O-I-G-E. It's called The Brain That Changes Itself, and it gives examples of uh, neuroplasticity in um, the course of treatment of a lot of different illnesses and disorders. It's a really interesting book if you, in your spare time, want to read it. Obviously not during the quarter. So, um, Habituation, by definition, decreased response to a repeated benign stimulus. It involves a decreased rela release of excitatory neurotransmitters, and it resolves in a very short time frame. So um, there's a little video on the vestibular habituation exercises that are often used in PT, and that's kind of interesting to watch. Um, the interesting thing about uh, vestibular treatment, I actually share an office with two vestibular specialists, and they have people that come in and get evaluated that say that they have had vertigo for 20 years and they never got evaluated by a PT and finally they get a doctor who refers them to PT and their symptoms resolve within two or three treatments. It's ab absolutely amazing. So um, it's, it's definitely something to look at and it's a really simple treatment and it can really help people live a better life, which is pretty cool. So um, we're going to get into now experience-dependent plasticity, learning and memory. Um, so this actually, when y for learning and memory, um, there's a term long-term potentiation, which involves persistent long-term changes in the strength of synapses with the repetition of a task. So if you continually stimulate a synapse and continually use it and continually use it, that synapse will become stronger. Um, there was a study done in the 80s actually with Russian athletes 
where they had them, uh, for example, like a tennis player, they had them perform their activity over and over and over again in, in a crazy amount of repetition. And they actually found that they had higher levels of neurotransmitters and neural modulators when they, of course, in the 80s when they did it, there wasn't any way to measure those. But then later on, they, um, they went back and did that and they were able to detect um, significant changes in the strength of synapses with the repetition, which is kind of neat. When you're first learning a new task, um, they found with functional MRI studies that there are greater regions of brain cells active initially when you're first learning the task. Later on, after you master a task, there are decreased regions of brain activity. So you can sort of imagine like when you were learning how to drive, you had to totally pay attention, you know, hands at 10 and 2 and your eyes are on the road and you can you barely look in the rear view mirror because you have to focus on everything so hard. You can imagine that there are lots of regions of your brain active. Well now that you've been driving for however many years, you've got your cell phone in one hand and a cup of coffee in the other and you're steering with your knees. <laughs> well hopefully not, but it takes less focus to perform the activity once you've learned it because less of your brain has to be active in doing it. So um, with the repeated stimulus, um, you actually get synthesis and activation of new proteins and that it changes the neurons excitability and promotes growth of new synaptic con uh, connections, um, which is kind of cool. So there's some videos, there's one that's an animated video um, of long-term potentiation. And then one, it was actually produced at the University of Washington about neuroplasticity and learning. And it's kind of a neat, it's, a, it's an analogy, um, but it's kind of a neat little link. It's about five minutes long, so you might want to watch that. So in long-term potentiation, it actually converts silent synapses to active synapses. It's the cellular level of learning. Um, the postsynaptic membrane actually changes and grows new dendrite. It's, it becomes more responsive to a repeated stimulus. Um, this is the mechanism that's involved in neural recovery following an injury, and also in improving your memory. If you practice your, if you practice memory, you practice memorizing things, you will get better at it. So um, there's another video on the Canvas Classroom about long-term potentiation, memory, and learning. This is an area that is um, frequently studied in different areas of neuroscience. So people who do behavioral neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience, as well as the cellular neuroscience, um, study this procedure or study this um, effect. So um, it's pretty interesting because it, that's really an interesting field of study is how do we learn things? How do we remember things? And um, one of the things that they have found in studies with rats, which a lot of initial neural studies are done with rats because they have a neurochemical profile that's very similar to ours. And also with a rat, you can do teach it things or do things to it. And then unfortunately, you can dispose of the rat and analyze its neurotransmitters. You can't really do that with a human being. Um, that's one of the reasons why I um, got out of the molecular biology field and into a field that was more associated with people because I really don't like working with rats. <laughs> but they found working with rats that when they raised rats in an enriched environment with more stimulus and more exciting things to do and challenging things, problems to solve, um, there was increased contact between the astrocytes and the neurons as compared to rats in just a regular old cage. And so that non-synaptic transmission information can also be important in neuroplasticity where the astrocytes are actually um, performing a communication function besides just their support functions. It's kind of cool stuff, actually. So um, some of these, so I have the PowerPoint and the Canvas Classroom and a lot of the, you know, a lot of the information I have in both things, but sometimes I find it's more useful to show both. So um, the main thing with long-term potentiation and learning and memory is that they are persistent long-term changes. They're when you um, strengthen that synapse and repeat the task, you eventually 
program it into your cells and it's a long-term change. So um, there's also long-term depression where you are not stimulating a neuron and it eventually stops the synapse stops being functional so you can have the opposite effect you're stimulating the neuron all the time the synapse becomes stronger if you never stimulate it it actually becomes depressed um, or the its reaction becomes depressed and eventually the synapse goes silent so um, when silent synapses there are a lot of um, and we'll talk about this a little bit in chapter 5 in the development chapter um, there are a lot of synapses that are just waiting out there until something happens and if you never stimulate them they will stay silent um, if you continue to stimulate them they will be converted into active synapses and the postsynaptic membrane actually grows new dendrites you can develop new synapses and then the thing we talked about in the rat study with the increased contact between the astrocytes and the neurons. So um, there are some diagrams in the book where they show the actual mole uh, molecular mechanism. I don't necessarily expect you to know anything about the N-methyl D-aspartate, the mDNA receptor. Um, it's interesting stuff, but we just do not need to know it on that level. Um, just know that more um, receptors are created when you get more stimulation, repeated stimulation. Okay, and that the um, astrocytes can contribute to that experience-dependent plasticity. So um, they were one of the things that astrocytes can do is they can um, modulate neurotransmitter release at the postsynaptic membrane. So um, kind of interesting stuff. Okay, we're going to wrap up this section, and in the next section we'll start talking about cellular recovery from injury.